Hi there, and welcome along to episode 107 of the JerseyNet podcast, the totally free and independent Rangers podcast that is made by the fans for the fans. And remember, guys, as we say every week, it's not just a podcast, it's free. If you head over to the website at www.jersnet.co.uk, you'll find uh, a whole treasure trove of articles, match previews, as well as the friendly discussion forum where you can find all of your JerseyNet contributors and get involved in the discussion. Um, if you are joining us on the podcast for the first time, then thank you very much for coming along. Uh, remember, you can always leave us a like, a, uh, a wee comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we're now available on Acast, iTunes, YouTube, Castbox, Stitcher, and even Spotify. Uh, so we're very, very pleased to have you along. If you're joining us live tonight, it's Sunday, it's 9.30, the podcast always does go out live. Um, then please do leave us a comment, let us know your questions, your thoughts on the game today, midweek at Galatasaray, uh, and we'll get to as many of those if we, as we can. As always, the pod will be available for download on Monday, so uh, please do, like I say, subscribe, and you'll never miss a thing from us here at Jersnet. Um, so it's been a, a, a hell of a week at Ibrox once again, uh, and we've got a lot to a lot to get through. We had a wee bonus pod in, in midweek as we looked at the group stage draw for the Europa League, um, but we've got two guests tonight. We'll, we'll take a look back at the Galatasaray game, the Ross County game today, and also we'll obviously look at the transfer window closing tomorrow. We'll take a wee look at the state of the squad as well. So on to the guests. Uh, it's a it's a cracking lineup tonight. Um, first of all, we have got Stuart Franklin. Frankly, uh, I hear that you had some celebrations in your house today. Hi Ross. Uh, good evening. Good evening to everybody. Um, I was my my eldest daughter's thirteenth birthday today, so um, we've been very busy. We we're up at that uh, you know the Ninja Warrior program on BBC. They've opened one of these things in, in Edinburgh, so we were up at that with her. So. Good fun had by all. It's and then back to the house and buffets and all the rest of it and had our pals round and uh, aye, great day. All well behaved and now I'm knackered. You managed to carve out ninety minutes to watch the game. I hope. I did. I managed to do that. I managed to get permission first. She doesn't like her dad anyway. She's a, a mummy's girl, so I managed to get away into another room and a bit of quiet. Headphones on and laptop on and listen to to Clyde Tilden and, and watch the, the Bears get a good win. Well, that's the thing. I suppose that she's getting to that age now where actually she wants to spend as much time away from you as possible. So she's probably sort of pushing you into the other room to watch the game. But I suppose yeah. she's got the best birthday present she could have asked for in a 2-0 two, two win. Oh, well, that's what I said to her. Um, I think she was too fussy. She does like the Rangers. She's been a couple of times, so um, can't argue with that. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Um, also joining us this evening, it's actually it's a very warm welcome back to someone who we've not had on for a, a wee while now, but is always got fantastic contributions um from the very popular four lads had a dream blog it's stevie clifford stevie welcome back thanks ross um hope everyone is well now tell me how have you uh, how have you been spending your your time away from the pod how's things going over at the blog yeah things have uh, things are fine it was a uh, pretty quiet took of uh, took some time away from um doing basically all the pods um and obviously stopped doing kind of fan media and things and and just took a, a step back from the the blog to kind of evaluate things a number of things going on Ross and, and sometimes you know they're more important um and and that was that was basically it but things are back on an even keel um now nice to be back on as well now what I will say is for anyone who's not heard the the four lads had the dream podcast that Stevie does there's a I mean there must be 20 episodes now of, of interviews with ex-players and people associated with the club. And I really would recommend anyone with an interest to, to go back and have a wee listen. Um, listen, gents, we have got a, a, a load to get through today. It's been a, a massive week and I do want to get through to talking about the transfer window and the state of the squad with um, only just over 24 hours left to go in the transfer window until January. Um, but we'll start by looking back at Thursday night when, when Rangers welcomed Turkey to Ibrox in, in the shape of Galatasaray. Um, a team that I kind of grew up looking at as a proper Champions League side, a real dominant European force, um, and one that actually kind of starts the nerves going when I hear a team like that coming to play Rangers. Frankie, we, we started the game really, really well, in my opinion, really pressing in, in the first 15 minutes. Were you kind of encouraged by the positive tone that Rangers set there? And they certainly didn't seem to go into the game with any nerves or, or be unsettled by the, the prospect of such a glamorous opposition. Aye, aye, they, they really did start the game quite strongly, played at a nice tempo, carved out a couple of chances and for the first, few, first 15 minutes or so, really Galatasaray couldn't get into the game and we looked really quite comfortable. Um, after that, we, we took our foot off the pedal, they settled a wee bit, 
obviously you've not got the crowd there to sort of egg you on again. So um, although they, they didn't look all that dangerous, I was starting to get a wee bit worried. I think they'll get a, a fair bit of joy doing their left-hand side. Um, and because our field was having to track back a bit more um, to to help Tav, we were sort of struggling to to get forward um, like we had done in the first 20 minutes. So it was it was even better to see us come out after half time and, and really take the game to them and and take two two good chances and I mean the two fantastic goals, very different, but some great football um, between the two of them. And um, obviously a wee bit of lucky to an extent with, with Barisic's deflected cross, but. Tav did brilliantly to, to head that in and, and we re looked really, really comfortable after that. Managed the game fantastically well and so much so that Galatasaray had to take off two of their better players um, and it was just a pity that we, we conceded late on. And we got, um, I think I think McGregor just got the fingertips onto the, the header and took it away for, for Ryan Jack but even then um, we, I thought Goldson was immense for the last five or ten minutes and they never looked like getting an equaliser so it was very much job done, and it was it was I, I was I was must admit I was confident beforehand, and so were the bookies because I, I was having a look. I think they were uh, Rangers were, were quite big favourites actually. My old man likes a bet, and, and he wasn't even touching Rangers because of the, the because of the price. So, um, ah, it was it was good to to uh, to get the result and to get into the the, the group stages again um, for the third year running. Really, really is fantastic going. And uh, the, the manager and. All the players that have contributed over the last three years deserve a lot of credit. I mean, clearly this year people are getting maybe a bit easier, less less games. But um, I mean, Galatasaray was the first game at home, so uh, and they're a good team, some good players. All right, maybe in the, the twilight of their careers, but they're, they've still got good CVs. And to go and take the game to them and and really dominate as we've done uh, domestically, and as I say, the the guys deserve a lot of credit. So. Well, entitled to their celebrations in the in the dressing room afterwards. I just want to pick up on one thing you said there, Frankie, is that kind of you know, that most of the first half was a bit nervy and a bit tense, and but the second half the, the boys have come out very positive and and on the front foot and and kind of dominated the game in the second half. What do you think Gerard has said to them at half time to try and you know batter the nerves out of the side? I think he's just told them to, to have a bit more belief in themselves. I think we just maybe showed Galatasaray right, just a bit too much respect and, and we're, we're just maybe a bit too nervous and maybe didn't trust ourselves to to um to to, to you know to to play a normal game and get men forward and, and leave gate leave leave gaps. Um so I think the managers just possibly said, listen, we're, we're at home. Okay, there isn't any fifty thousand uh, Rangers fans behind us, but we can we can still take the game to them. We can still make the, the most of that home advantage, and let's just try and get the, the job done. And I, and I think that the, the players are, have risen to that. I mean, we just kept playing the way we've been doing with some good football. I mean, the, the, it was fantastic play for the the opening goal, and what, what a finish for our field. Really calm and composed, exactly what you're wanting for in that situation. Um, and then, as I said, to get, I think it was a big help getting the second goal so soon after that, and it really allowed us to to, to settle any sort of nerves. Meanwhile, Galatasaray, the, I think it, it, it sort of was a bit of sucker punch the second goal, to be honest. And uh, so, as I say, the, the manager deserves a lot of credit. So it was just a bit of shame today that the, we didn't seem to, to well, we maybe lack the legs a wee bit just to, to to push on after that result. But I think, I think we're. We're, um, we're being a bit pedantic if we're expecting fantastic performances in every game. Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely right. Um, Stevie, the first goal, which was sort of five or ten minutes after the after the second half kicked off, um, was a wonderful free-flowing attacking move, you know, ball on the deck, uh, passing it really, really nicely, a wee sort of step over our dummy from Morelos when you might have expected him to take it on and take a snapshot. Uh, a lovely ball in uh, inside from Hadji, and you know, as as Frankie says, a very nice touch from Scott Arfield. Now Arfield is a player that I was quite critical of for the majority of last season, and I thought he kind of peaked and was was dwindling at the tail end of his career. But he really seems to have uh, have sparked some kind of renaissance in his form. Stevie, what do you think has has caused that, and and how happy are you to see Scott Arfield getting a run in the team and, and really contributing to? To positive results. I thought that um, Scotty was one of the ones when we did falter at the at the end of um, the curtailed season last year. That um, I thought he was actually producing good form, and, and Scott Arfield is capable. Um, and what I think goes unnoticed from Scott Arfield is he, he does put in a, 
a hell of a shift as well. He does a lot of um, groundwork and, and things, but he does he does make those runs beyond. He, he done it at Easter Road and should have scored, did score at Easter Road um, as, as well. So he deserved his goal the other night. He was very good the other night. And um, just, you know, just to, to, to comment on that victory over Galatasaray, that was an excellent result. We won't get the, the credit we deserve. Um, you know, there's there's people lining up to to have a pop at us because how dare we be happy? But um, it was an excellent result. Willem Tway the week before was a fantastic result as well. And to qualify, the team have done brilliant. They deserve all the plaudits. And if you'd said to me at the start of the week that um, we, you know, after Motherwell that we would go through on Thursday and then take a clean sheet and a victory today, then I would have grabbed it and been delighted. So it's it's been a good week for us. Um, and you know, in terms of in terms of Scotty, like I'm really happy for him because I think that Scott Arfield is a good player. I think that he offers something different that um, our midfield don't have. He's, he's got the ability to go beyond and he can strike the ball. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy for him. Um, you know, he's he's taken his opportunity when Aribo's been out. So all credit to him. I hope it continues because if it continues and these guys are pitching in with 5, 10, you know, 12 goals and it's going to relieve the pressure on, on the front men, and especially when you have Alfredo, who, who seems to be going through a bit of a kind of bipolar spell. You never know what you're getting from him. So, yeah, I'm delighted for Scott Arfield, and he deserves he deserves every bit of praise as well. Now, before we come back to talking about the second goal, just wanted to pick up on something you said there, Stevie, was that, you know, we're not going to get the credit that we deserve for that performance. And I completely agree that that was... You know, that to me was one of our standout European performances and results for the last 15 years. But there does seem to have been a narrative that as soon as we get that result, you know, we're flooded with messages that will Galatasaray, they're not the team that they once were. That's that's the phrase we keep seeing. And by the way, we keep seeing it as well about Benfica. Now that we've drawn Benfica in the group stage, well, Benfica, they're not the they're not the team they once were. Same with Galatasaray. Um, I'm not saying that about AC Milan, by the way, but that's another story. Why do you think that there is that kind of narrative that's immediately been pushed? Do you think that that's kind of a deliberate tactic in, in the media? I don't listen to, to what the, the media have got to say, Ross, in, in all honesty, in terms of, um, obviously, it's it's you see it on social media and things and you, and you can't avoid it, but it's, it's not worth it. I've, I've learned a long time ago that, you know, that they are not worth listening to. I know how well we did on, on Thursday night. That the, the supporters know how well they did on Thursday night as well. And and that's all that matters. So you've got to remember that there's a lot of people out there that don't want to see Rangers do well. So there's there's bitterness and there's um, a hatred that comes out whenever we do get anything done. So it's we just need to use them to fuel the fire and, and keep going as far as I'm concerned. And we got a good result Thursday night. And it's up to us to, to set the narrative and, and keep winning and, and then it'll force these people to recognise that. So concentrate on ourselves, keep getting the results and we, you know, we've got a great chance in the in, in the group stages as well. So take it a game at a time and, and look forward to it. Um, there's a lot of people out there that, that criticise us that would love to be in our position where every game is massive um, and they don't. So let's enjoy it for what it is. Well, absolutely. And as we were saying in the sort of bonus midweek pod that we did, Steven Gerrard's record in Europe is unbelievable. You know, to, to come through all of those qualifiers and not once slip up. You know, there's so many potential banana skins there and he's not he's not fallen at any of them. So um, I don't think we get the, the praise or the credit that we deserve for putting these runs together year on year on year. We don't. Um, I mean, what's his record? Five defeats in 35? Yeah. So, I, I, um, and sorry, Ross, I was going to say as well, see Willem Tui last week. That'll that'll not get the recognition it deserves, but that's one of our best results in Europe in, in the last 30, 40 years. To go to Holland and take four off them, um, you know, and immediately we got, well, they're not a good side and everything else. They are a good side. And it, it showed you how well McGregor and things had to play. So look, all credit to them. Absolutely all credit to them. But I do want them, I want them now to park it um, back in their minds and, and start concentrating on, on the league at hand and things like that. And it just shows you how important today was. And today's a big result, and you know we'll talk about that. And there might be criticism of of their um, performance and things, but it won't be from me. So um, I'm very, very happy and positive about where we are. Now, Frankie, coming back to today's uh, to Thursday's game, sorry, the the, the second goal was, um, you know, a proper team move. Let's call it 
where you know the, the the move that started from the goalkeeper, um, and and very quickly the ball finds itself up the other end of the park through some some phenomenal passing. Just just talk us through that goal and um, you know the the kind of skill and the craft involved in it. I don't think it's just skill. It's it's bravery. I mean, Gerard's always going on about about being brave on the ball, and and uh, you've seen that throughout that uh, the Galatasaray that I gave, but especially um, with that second goal, just because obviously it goes for Goldson out to to Tav, and they're under pressure, and it's tough to watch sometimes when we play this sort of risky risky game, but it's it's important that we do that because teams are giving the high press to us, so if we are able to play around that high press. I mean, clearly it creates space further forward and the and, and helps us uh, make chances and that's exactly what happened with that goal and, and Stevie was right to mention Morelos earlier there to, um, so it's some so it's schizophrenic performances late, lately in some games he's really been top class and others he's been I wouldn't say so much anonymous but just um, just lacking quality but I think I think it has to be mentioned and, and noticed and underlined that we've asked Morelos to change the way he plays. Very rarely now do we play the ball into the channel. We used to play the ball fairly long into the channels. Alfie would, would go and run it, make a chance out of nothing himself and score. Now, very rarely do we do that. We didn't play the ball long to him. If we do play the ball long, it's usually to to the likes of um, Ryan Kent or to the obviously to the fullbacks. So Morelos has been quite creative and improving his link-up play lately. He's coming much deeper. We've seen it at Aberdeen at Pedodri in the first game of the league game of the season. We've seen it in several other games as well, where he comes short and he either plays the layoff pass, he plays, he does a dummy, and then we take it for there and quite often we score. And and as I say, that, that's where his game's changed. It's a shame because obviously he's been a bit more off form in terms of his own, his own uh, goal striking and, and chance taking. I mean, today he should have scored at least once. Again, it's just a pity. And, People will say, like, he's in the half, he wants to move. I think he's just frustrated with himself. I just think he realises he's not playing as well as he can. Um, he's not scoring, taking the chances as he usually does. So I think he's, I don't think he's annoyed with, with Rangers or, or or where he is. I think he's, he's probably happy. I'm sure he'd, he'd like to move if he can get a good move. But I think he's just unhappy with his own form. And, and that's fair enough because he hasn't been his, his very best. But I think Alfie's still shows in most games how, how much an important player he is and how much a focal point he is in terms of attack. And and I think it says a lot about his overall quality that he has had to change it, the way he plays and the way, the way he contributes to the team this season and that he's coping with that. And he's still contributing. He's still helping create chances and create goals. And for that, he deserves a, a lot of credit. I think you're right, Frankie. And I think we'll come on to talk about Morelos in the context of the transfer window in, uh, in a wee bit. But... You could even see it, his his contribution outside of of goal scoring. You could see it on Thursday in in the the shadow or the dummy that he did for the the first goal. You could see it even today in some of the mid to long range passes that he were playing. Was uh, you know he, he he's got undeniable quality, and you're right that the versatility that he's shown to adapt his game and still be one of the best in the country is uh, is really really promising. Um, he he does blow hot and cold. He is a bit schizophrenic with his performances, but he's um, he's still a hell of an asset. And uh, uh, as I say, we'll come on to talk about the transfer situation in a moment. But um, you certainly won't find too many people complaining that we'll still have him at the end of the transfer window. Stevie, one blemish on Thursday's performance was conceding what I would say was quite a sloppy set piece goal towards the end, which then didn't do any favours for any of the supporters' nerves. Were you disappointed to see that goal go in? And is this maybe a symptom of what we've discussed before as being poor game management from Rangers, causing ourselves more problems than we needed to do from a comfortable position? Yeah, well, it was classic Rangers, wasn't it? Because we, we do it all the time. Like um, We always have to, to kind of make it tough for ourselves. And listen, it happens. You know what? Um, Ryan Jack needs to be shouting about miscommunication. The boy was free. It happens. Look, is it is it a worry in terms of after a couple of free headers today? Yes, it is. I think they need to just kind of tighten up again and, and make sure they're fully concentrated on these things. But it happens. Um, was I annoyed? Absolutely, Ross. But I moan about absolutely everything, as you know. So yes, I, I was. Um, it did annoy me in, in in terms of that because we want to get our clean sheets and everything else. But you know what? It's it's a victory. It was a mistake. And and we move on. I, 
you know, I would rather they made their mistakes when it didn't count rather than making their mistakes when it, it does hurt us. So mistakes happen, it is what it is. Um, I don't, I'm not sure who was supposed to be picking them up at the time, but, um, you know, the, you've got an error and whoever was marking them, you've got an error in McGregor and you've got an error in, in Jack. So it's all these little things that can add up and you, you maybe even a wee bit harsh on, on, on Jack there, but I just think that, you know, the guy on the line should be screaming there and, Ach, it is what it is. You know, it's, it's a mistake. We got away with it and and we move on. As I said, I would rather they make those mistakes so that they can eradicate them and make sure that, um, you know, they, they don't make them when they when it really does hurt. So I think we, we just move on from it. Yeah, you're right. And, and actually what's been telling has been that how few mistakes we've had this season. You know, obviously the, the, the clean sheet record that we set at the start of the season speaks for itself, but the fact that when that goal went in, Clive Tilsley went, that's the first goal I've seen Rangers concede. Now, you know, it's, it's actually quite staggering, the consistency that we have shown at the back. And, and we've mentioned um, tonight so far, we have we've spoken a wee bit about Connor Goldson, but the consistency that he and Philip Hollander in particular have shown at the back has been remarkable. Same with Tav, same with Barisic. So look, a, a mistake is going to creep in every now and then. and It's cost us a goal and thankfully didn't cost us any more than that. And, and ultimately, it's it's something that will be completely forgotten about when we're looking ahead to the, the rest of the journey that we have in Europe. Now, Frankie, looking ahead to the rest of that journey, obviously the draw was made um, Friday lunchtime. And I think actually, as we discussed on that on that bonus pod on Friday, the draw does look quite favourable to Rangers at the moment with um, Benfica, Standard Liège and uh, Lech Poznan. What's your immediate reaction to the the task that lies ahead for Rangers in the group stages? Um, I think, again, it'll be quite similar to the last um, the last few years or the last couple of years where we've been in the group stage. I think the, the quality of the teams is is fairly similar to, to what we've um, experienced in those two years. And I think uh, Benfica are, are probably still favourites. I mean, they have lost a couple of players, but I think they've spent something like 85 million euros in the summer. So that's not a bad budget. To have, I wish we had that kind of budget. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you can buy a great team or um, be favourites, but I, th- I think they probably still are. Um, you're in pot one for a reason. Um, in terms of the other three teams, I mean, I think I think you're probably probably fairly level with Standard Liège in, t- in terms of uh, quality and experience. Whereas Le- Lech Poznan are definitely arguably the, the the weakest side in the group, so you're looking to to take six points for them, but. I think I don't think it'll be as easy as some some fans think it will be. I, I think it's a very positive draw, and I'm, I'm confident. And and one good thing I was pleased to to see after the draw was Gerard saying he expects us to qualify. So right away he's putting onus on the players. In previous seasons he's maybe thought, listen, if we can get out of the group, great. Um, it's a sort of free hit. But this year he's he's asking for a bit more from his squad and his players and saying, listen, now we're favourites to at least qualify. So I, I think I agree with that. I think. Um, I think it's a big ask to win the group. I think we're capable, um, but we certainly should be qualifying, and I'm, I'm confident um, that, that we can do that, and certainly if we, if we keep playing the, the way we have done in, in the last couple of years in Europe. Look, at the end of the day, it's it, it's exciting to be discussing you know, the potential of winning the group as opposed to just trying to scrape out of the group. Um, it's, it's thrilling to be back in, in the group stages for a third year in a row, as we said, midweek. That, uh, that wouldn't necessarily have happened 15, 20 years ago. We'd qualify for the group stages three years in a row. So it really is testament to Gerard and his team as, as to the success that they've displayed in Europe. It's, it's actually quite staggering. And you look across at Celtic, who are taking 90 minutes to break down teams from Latvia or Sarajevo. And it's uh, it, it was a really, really pleasing situation on on Thursday and I'm I'm pleased again with the teams that we've got in the draw because I do it makes me feel very very optimistic we've got a, a really really good chance to you know proceed out of the group stages again and, and it's more money more revenue for the club it's more exposure for the club more prestige so I think all in all a, a really really positive outcome from from the draw gents if we move on to the game today against Ross County um possibly Arguably a less glamorous tie, um, going from Galatasaray to the team from Dingwall, but arguably actually the more important game in, in terms of making sure that we don't drop more points and, and give Celtic an opportunity to, to you know, 
make things a lot more nervy at the top and uh, going into the international break and obviously coming back against them in the old firm in two weeks' time. Stevie, there were multiple changes from midweek. Um, notably, Philip Hollander was completely out of the out of the match day squad, and and Leon Balogun was brought back into start. Now, my view of the game was that Balogun was poor, was actually possibly one of the worst players on the pitch today. Didn't seem to win any aerial battles, and and actually seemed to really really struggle and and looked lost at times. His positioning, I thought, was weak. Often lost his man or was found wrong side. Was it? a risk to drop someone like Hollander, who has been so consistent this season um, and performing so well, to bring back Balogun, who has missed quite a lot of football so far through injury? No, it shouldn't be, um, Ross, because if we felt like that, then we're, we're venturing uh, territory like last season when nobody was getting a rest and then eventually, you know, they burn out. Um, we have to use the squad. Um, Balogun's more than capable. Um and yeah, he, he might not have um, been his absolute best today. But again, I mean, it's, it's one of those ones where he's not taking an opportunity. Holander comes back in. But I think the big fellow has been absolutely tremendous this year. I think a lot of people, um, for some reason, don't rate him. And I think he's absolutely brilliant. So very steady, very understated defender. But the job he did midweek on, on Falco was, was incredibly good. So I can understand why they're just um, watching you know, with him and just making sure that he's all right, because he is vitally important. And, you know, it has to be said as well that um, when when we did kind of fall apart last year, um, he was he was missing. So he's a very important player for us. Balogun comes in, doesn't take his opportunity, and, and he'll go out again. It's just, you know, Ross, <clears throat> it's not a risk in terms of, it's not like you're dropping him for a young 20-year-old boy. So they have to utilise his squad. So, um I don't um, think that there was any issues with with Gerard's team selection. He's he's trying to freshen it up and, and keep people, you know, well, fit with game time and things. So, not a big deal for me. If if we keep looking at that team selection, one of the other parts that stood out for me was um, a second league start in a row for Jordan Jones, who I think we all have to admit flourished last time out against Motherwell. Um, was was very impressive, took his goal really, really nicely. Um, so he was brought in for another start today. Stevie, what kind of future do you see for him? Obviously, we all know that sort of the the information being leaked out of the club these days is very, very tightly controlled, but you don't have to be a, a mind reader to see that the club has actively been trying to ship Jordan Jones out. There's been allegedly some clubs down in uh, the Championship in England interested. Apparently, Middlesbrough were sniffing around for a while. Um he finds himself still at the club with a day to go left in the transfer window. Do you think that today and, and his start against Motherwell were signs that actually Jordan Jones does have a long-term future at Rangers or was this more him being put in the shop window to earn his move? Um, uh, here we go. I'll probably sound harsh when I say this, but no, I don't think he has um, a future. Um, I don't think he's good enough, um, consistently enough. Um, I think he is a good player and I think he can be, but I don't know if, if there seems to be a, a kind of mentality or attitude issue with him. Um, I didn't think he was that impressive today, um, but he never is. I mean, you know, Jordan Jones is, is good to run in behind and to stretch games. And um, Jordan Jones is, is the type of player that, that would be handy, um, you know, in a, in a way European game and, and things like that, as we've seen last year in Copenhagen. But Jordan Jones, for me, doesn't have the quality that we need at this present time um, in, in his career to, to be a first-team starter. And, and that's not, listen, it's not meant to sound as harsh as it probably does, but I, again, I don't think that, um, you know, that some of the guys today should be starters for us. We, we can be squad players and things, but I just don't think that, that Jordan Jones is, is one of them. Um, he's, he's probably somewhere in the in the regional Barker for me. We'll, we'll give you moments, we'll um, do well at times, but if we're looking to, to win titles and looking to do things, Jordan Jones isn't isn't a starter for me. Um, so I, th- I think we do need a, an upgrade on on the right hand side of, of our attack. Um, it's just one of those. That listen, that's going to sound harsh, Ross, but um, for me, he he, he doesn't have a, a future for us unless he can show some sort of level of consistency that he hasn't done so far. I don't know if it sounds harsh because I actually think it it seems to chime very nicely with all of what the supporters saying and and really that 
kind of feeling that you get from the management team is that you know he was he was out of the team for so long after that old firm game last season that he you know you know there were questions around his attitude and his mentality as as you rightly say that um, I, I think you're right that today he was probably there out of necessity rather than being a, a first choice pick. I think he earned his chance last week. I think you, you need to give him credit for that. So he earned his chance, um, and he, he was really good last week. But today he was. He was just the of the way you would expect. There was a there was an incident in the first half, Ross, where him and, and Morelos were kind of two v two, and he ended up playing a really poor pass, and he, he kind of made a bit of an arse of it, and and that's that's that, that's where you need to, to grab your opportunity in the way that maybe Brandon Barker did, although the game was he had more space and it was slightly more stretched. It was Brandon Barker took his opportunity, Jordan Jones didn't. And, and it goes away back to kind of something that Frankie said earlier on about Morelos' attitude and being upset. You could see the frustration at the pass Morelos got and because he was in and in a better final ball um, instead of going down the, the right-hand side and maybe in the left would have, would have given Morelos an opportunity. And that, if, if Jordan Jones wants to be a first-team player and wants to be you know first-team squad for Rangers, he needs to take opportunities like today. Um, and he didn't. And again, I'm probably coming across as harsh as, as one, but these are the ones where if you wanted to, to stake a, a claim and, and make your name, then you know he, he has to do it. And he didn't. And it just it just goes back to my own feeling that you'll never be any more than a bit part. Um, put it like this: if somebody came in and offered a, a decent amount tomorrow, I would I would not bat an eyelid and, and say that he, he should be on his way. So that's that's where I am with him. I think that's that's probably very much in keeping with the the majority of views that I've seen about Jordan Jones from the support. And actually, I think that obviously, if you ignore the the game midweek where he where he didn't feature, you look at Motherwell last week and Ross County today. He had one game where he was exceptional. You know, he did really really well. Scored a wonderful goal. His his passing, his movement were were really good. And then this week, against you know weaker opposition. And at home, he's completely ineffective, and he doesn't he doesn't produce anything. His his output is poor. His final ball is poor. It's the perfect actual kind of way to sum up Jordan Jones. That one week he'll be electric, the next week he'll be anonymous, and he might expect that to be okay because well, last week I was great. Unfortunately, when you you know when you're in this Rangers team, as a wide player, you're going up against Ryan Kent. You're going up against Yanis Hadji, potentially Kamar Roof. Or Joe Aribo could also be played on the flanks. You're going up against some of our best players, you know, some of our most valuable assets, some of our most skillful players. You know, turning it on once every few games is not it's not good enough. It's not good enough to to get you in the side consistently. So I'm I'm much like you, Stevie. I think that actually if we do still have Jordan Jones by the time the transfer window closes tomorrow, that will not be out of choice. That will be out of a lack of suitors that have been found for him. And maybe that's because we're asking for too much money. But if that's the case, also, I have to say, I'm not too disappointed because we have been kind of ripped apart in the transfer window over the last few seasons, selling our assets or letting our assets go for no money. Um, so I, I don't want to I don't want to undersell him. I don't want to lose him for 100k. Um, but any semi sensible offer that came in, I think I think the club would be very willing to do a deal. Now, Frankie, one player that, that Stevie mentioned a couple of times there, and I think we need to discuss is, is Brandon Barker. Obviously, he's come on today, coming back from injury, comes on, looks reasonably lively. Um, as, as Stevie says, the game was stretched and there was less energy in the game, and he comes on as a fresh pair of legs. But he did look lively. He looked hungry, and he took his goal well. It was, you know, it was composed. And I was sat there going, shoot, 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 and he kept cutting across, kept cutting across, and and finally gets the goal. And he, I think he took it really, really nicely. Now, we mentioned Scott Arfield a while ago having a renaissance, but that is nothing compared to the journey that Brandon Barker has been on getting next to no football last season, but coming in and almost being a first choice this year. Um, tell me your thoughts on on Barker as a player and the journey that he's been on, and, and really, where does he go from here? Um, I think it's pretty similar to the conversation you just had about Jordan Jones, to be honest. I, th- I, think, um, I think there's a few players in that situation, Greg Stewart arguably being another, um, but there's there's clearly talented players. You can see that they've got a lot of quality. Um, they can be good on the ball. They can finish. 
Um, but where they lack is is that consistency to really um, make them first choice players, and and that's a kind of vicious circle that they're stuck in, unfortunately, because Jones did do well when he came on um, in Holland, and then he did excellent at, um, at Fir Park, and it probably considered himself hard done by not to be playing against Galatasaray. So uh, it wasn't a surprise to see him start today. I think I think that was his reward for for playing well at, at Motherwell and. Uh, but it was a different type of game today. I think Ross Kenny played that wee bit deeper and he had a, a wee bit less room. But he didn't seem quite as willing to get into the game either. And when he did get the ball, he was kind of taking the wrong choice in terms of... He very rarely took, tried to take a man on, for example. He was trying to play cute passes and and he, he, he didn't get into the game at all. I think I think that sums it up. So this is where he, the problem now, because now Barker, um, he was doing okay, got injured... And now he's back in the team, came on for the last, what, 15 minutes or so. Um, didn't really do very much, actually, either. He was kind of sort of on the on the, on the the fringes of the game. But then he, he scored, he, he took it well. He, he, um, he, he came across, I think, again, Morelos occupied the, the defenders, which allowed Barker to come in on his, on his favoured left, and, and he finished it well. So it's a bit of a conundrum for the manager. Do we play one of these? Which one does he play? I mean, Greg Stewart, as I mentioned the other, he, the same's happened for him. He's came in the odd game, did quite well, and then seems to disappear. So I think all three of them aren't good enough. Um, and I'd quite like to trade all three of them for one good player. And I think that's probably what the manager would like to do. But the problem then you've got is your, your squad starts to get a bit thin. And we've already seen, I mean, we brought in Eton and we brought in uh, Kmar Roof, and both are injured. So if you get rid of Jones, Stewart and Barker and buy somebody else and they get injured, you have nobody else to bring in because Ariwo was missing as well. So you've got to have these guys on the fringes of the squad that are that are capable and that can come in and do a job when required. That, but it is tough. It's tough for them to, to, to show quality when they're only getting 10, 15 minutes here or there. So I've got a lot of sympathy for, for them all. Um, I mean, the Rangers fans are, are notoriously fickle, of course, as well. I mean, I can include myself in that and... Uh, we lack a bit of patience and I, th I think we've just got to to try and apply that where we can apply a bit of patience and, and just hope to see the best of them and it's up to the manager as well I think I think Gerard's got to try and settle on which one he thinks is the best out of the three and really stick by them and play them even if they maybe have a poor game here or there so I mean as I say Jones wasn't great today but will he play in the next game I don't know so th this is a it's one of the tougher questions for the manager and something that he has to answer if if we've to utilise our squad as we go deeper into the season and, and maintain good results. It's a it's a strange one though, Frankie, because I, I completely agree with what you're saying about Jones and, and Greg Stewart that they don't have a huge chance to impress and they get 10, 15 minutes here and there, but they never really seem to take it. Brandon Barker, I think he started four or five games this season. So he's almost sort of working himself into a position of being first choice. Do you think that that's because of what he's doing on the training pitch, or is it more of a necessity that we don't have enough options in the flanks to, you know, to really satisfy the need that Gerard has in that position that he finds himself having to rely on someone like Brandon Barker? Is it a weakness in the squad? Possibly to an extent, but I think that the other way of looking at it is, is Barker is more similar to Kent in terms of. He's able to play more centrally or in a sort of more free role, whereas I think Jones is much more comfortable out wide and getting in behind players. Whereas Barker and Kent, they can do both. They can use their pace to get in behind where the opportunity presents itself, for example, in European games. But they're also capable of coming short, taking the ball short, beating a player, committing players, but also using the ball well, finding passes, finding vertical passes, getting the ball wide to the, the fullbacks. Whereas, as I say, Jones is a bit more one-dimensional. Um, Stuart, I think, is capable of, of, of doing what Kent does and what um, Barker does, but he lacks, obviously, pace. And I think he's more comfortable, certainly further forward, probably with his back to goal rather than doing stuff in deeper areas because he can't do he can't beat a man or two men and run 30 or 40 yards. That's not what his game's about. So, as I say, I, th I think if you're going... I don't think the three of them are good enough. I'll say it again and... I feel the same as what Stevie did five, ten minutes ago when you feel a bit negative in, in, in that outlook. And to be honest, I don't think either of the three of them are a starter anyway. The only reason we're having this conversation is because Aribo's injured. Normally, Aribo would probably play a bit deeper 
and it would maybe be Hadji or Arfield that would be playing the, in the, the, the sort of more attacking midfield position. So, um, and obviously you've got Kemar Roof as well that can play play that that deeper role as well. So we do have better options there. I think it's just where we are right now is we're having to utilise the squad. So I think, uh, as I say, the conundrum for the manager is to to choose one and to stick with that one person. And I think Barker's Paul are the better option, just in the fact that he's he's got more about him in terms of how he manages his play and, and how he how he fits into the, our system. So I, I think that's probably why he's been favoured over over Jones and, and and Stuart. Now, Stevie, just as a last word on the game today, it's it's fair to say it wasn't a classic and it certainly didn't live up to the excitement of the Galatasaray game midweek. Um, do you think that the players were suffering from fatigue or rust or, a, a, you know, the continental hangover effect that, that people talk about? Or is it maybe, you know, just a come down from the the high of Thursday, the, the elation of getting into the group stages, um, you know, j- just getting back to the grind of the SPFL, back to another team that wants to sit deep? Um, what do you put down as a, as a cause for that kind of lacklustre and low energy performance today? Before I get to that, Ross, eh, I'm going to frustrate you by going back to Brandon Barker a wee bit. Um, first of all, I agree with what um, Stuart was saying in terms of, um, you know, Stuart, um, Jones and, and Barker. But I, I also think that Brandon Barker has earned his opportunity. He had a really good pre-season. Um, and, and I've always thought that, that Brandon Barker looks like the type of guy that doesn't really believe that he should be at Rangers. He's a, he's a confidence player. So... I've actually enjoyed what I've seen from him this year. I think he's earned the opportunity to have the cameos um, and, and have the starts. He's, he's not the type of player that, that's going to start in a, in a couple of weeks at, um, at Parkhead, but he is the type of player that could come on, you know, when the game's in the last 15 minutes and it's stretched and things like that. So out of the three of them, if I was given the option, I, I would keep Brandon Barker, and I think he does that on merit in terms of what he's shown us so far. Is he good enough overall? then that's, that's to be judged. But he's also got a big contract. He, he earns a, a pretty penny at us, so we have to try and get something out of him. And that either comes from getting something out of him so that we can move him on or getting out something out of him so that he does be, flourish and become a first-team player. So I think that's where, where Barker maybe um, has, has got a slight advantage over the other ones because we do have to, to get something from him. He's on a four-year deal. so But I also think as well that he has taken the opportunities this year. So... Um, you know, there might be some people kind of scratching their heads at that. Again, to reiterate, I don't think he's the answer or, or overall good enough, but he's shown more than the other two in terms of being able to, to take his opportunity, I think. So moving on to, to, to today, um, Ross, as I said earlier, that I said on the on the blog, and today was always going to be difficult because Ross County, having been thrashed um, by our, our neighbours a, a couple of weeks ago, 5-0 at home. They were never going to open up and it was always going to be the long ball to the big guy up front, which we don't like. Um, and once you take Davis out of the team today as well, I think he dictates a lot of, a lot of the play and things like that. So um, we definitely need to, to sort out our midfield, which which you've seen today. Um, but I do think it's a combination of things. I think it, there is a European come down. I think there is, um, you know, it, it takes so much the team um, out of the team when you get a performance like Thursday night and then you have to go and try and raise it and do it again today so um, I'm not going to be too hard on them today I'm going to be positive they, they won they got the points um, and yeah they, they survived uh, they were lucky um, twice there was a wee one two that the boy miscontrolled that uh, went through to McLaughlin and then there was obviously the free header by Donaldson around about 80 minutes so there was two opportunities there and then they had another header at, at, at 2-0 so did we slightly ride our luck? I suppose at moments we did, but it wasn't it wasn't an undeserved result in terms of we were completely in control. But I think at times we were too passive, um, weren't quick enough, and we didn't um, show enough intent. Um, Alfredo was off his game. We didn't really have enough from um, the wide areas and things like that. So it's just it's just one of those ones where, um, you know, you take your three points, you you, you just got on with it afterwards, and it does go. Um, it does go a lot in, in terms of, of Thursday, but we have to be realistic. You cannot win every single game. And I watched Rangers at the end of last year and they couldn't couldn't buy a win. So if you're picking up three points and a clean sheet and scoring a couple of goals, um, when you're not on top form, then I'm, I'm happy to take it. So 
it goes it it goes kind of up and down for me in terms of 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 that. Um, it's just one of those ones, Ross. You take the three points and you move on. It, the manager's not going to be happy. He's going to know, but also we need to be realistic as a support that it's about the three points. So I'm not going to get too hung up on it, mate. Stay positive. We had a cracking result at Fur Park after you know a brilliant win in Holland, and then we had a brilliant win against Galatasaray. And we had a good win today. And yeah, I mean, it's going to take its toll. It's going to catch up in them a wee bit. So well done to them for getting that result. Look, you, you're kind of echoing what, what Gary McAllister said pretty exactly in, in his post-match comments on Rangers TV. Yeah, we I haven't we heard that, mate. So it, if he has said that, then that's good. I went out to, to referee tonight, so I haven't seen any of the stuff with Tav or, or Gary Mack or that yet, and I will watch it. But I just think there's a wee bit of, of kind of patience needed in, in terms of, of our our support and especially online and stuff, you know, take the positive three points and, and we're still there. So we, we just keep going. I think that's, the, you know, that's the point, isn't it? That you're not always going to have a, you know, a barnstorming performance where you overpower the opposition, but you're right. There was control there. There were a couple of nervy moments where we got lucky and we rode that luck, but we were never out of control of the game. We were a bit passive. We were a bit lackluster and a bit pedestrian and probably a bit fatigued. And the international break, I suspect, might be coming at a good time. One thing I do want to ask, though, Stevie, just as a last point on this game, um, Brandon Barker did a post-match interview in which he actually said that this is a game that last year we might not have won. Um, now, it's, a, it's one of those cliches. You know, another cliche from today is that, you know, title-winning teams need to find a way to win ugly, and maybe we did that today. But one of the cliches is that, that this is a game we might have lost last year, and it's something we've said on this show enough of the time. And, and sometimes I think that that may be oversimplifies it a wee bit but do you think that there's any merit in that in terms of showing the mental progression of this side and and the the improvement in the mental strength that we have this year compared to 12 months ago um no i'm not going to get too hung up on that see if the players want to believe that then great um see if we're still doing this in march then yeah i'll say that mentally we've been better and things like that but um we've been here before and this was a wee bit of what i was trying to say in the blog this week as well you know, Europe was fantastic and everything else, but we need to become ruthless and relentless. We have to. If we want to progress and, and go one better, and we need to, this this is it now. We can't keep having, you know, um, well, we'll go again next year and, well, Gerard needs another um, transfer window and things like that. It has to be now, Ross. Um, and, and this, you know, Rangers are built on success and, and winning things, and we need to, we need to produce this year. So, you know, if, if the players want to believe that this is a, a better mentality thing and all that, great, because that will do them good. But for me, I'll start judging it when it gets to February and March. And if we're able to do these things in February and March, then I'll say, great, we have learned our lesson and, and fantastic. For me today, um, it's a great sign that they did win when they weren't wasn't uh, weren't playing well. But um, I, I just think that uh, we've got a wee bit to prove yet before we can we can start talking about having a better mentality and, and stuff like that. Sorry if that Maybe. sounds harsh, buddy. I'm I'm still kind of raw from the kind of collapses we've seen in the last few years. So for me they've, they've got a, a wee bit to go before but I jump on board. No, you're you're right though that it doesn't it doesn't matter whether this is a game that we would have won or not twelve year twelve months ago. If the players believe that and if that helps them, then then fine, because actually something does seem to be different, that they do seem to be able to grind out these results. And if the players believe it and it helps them get these games over the line, then then fantastic. You know, we're not going to argue with that. Frankie, yeah, absolutely, bud. I agree with you. That's that's what I was kind of trying to say. I was just, uh, I'm, uh, I'd, I'd take a wee bit more convincing before I jump on that. Not a problem at all. That's why I'm in the host's chair. Um, Frankie, I think we, we should... You know, for the last 10 minutes of the show, let's take a wee look at the transfer window, which obviously closes tomorrow. Um, and it's been an interesting window for Rangers, bringing in a number of players. Obviously, Hadji signs permanently. Um, Big Itten and, and Cedric Roof up front. Leon Balogun at, at centre-half. John McLaughlin in goal. Um, and, and one or two others as well. But the whole window really has been dominated by speculation around Alfredo Morelos. There were the, beat, the bids that came in from Lille that seemed to disappear about six weeks ago. Um, there's been talk about him maybe going over to the Middle East. There's been one or two things, but now it seems to have all kind of gone quiet. Um, obviously, we're talking about hours left now rather than days or weeks. Where do you think that, that he'll be come the end of the window? I've not got a clue, Paul. Um, 
What I would say is I, I don't think we would have signed Roof and Eton if Morelos was staying. I, I think at that point, so what, six weeks ago, two months ago, I, I think we were probably 99% certain that Morelos was going to move. And I think we've maybe just been caught short to a certain extent in that Lille or whoever else possibly want to play hardball when it comes to what they're prepared to pay. I mean, I, I think Rangers are quite right to to hold out for 20 million. I think Morelos is worth that. I think you could argue he's worth more when you see some of the um, the dross that's playing in the English Premiership that goes for that go for tens of millions of pounds. Um, in terms of I'm staying at Rangers, I, I love Morelos. I think he's a fantastic player. He's not had a great season this season. I think he's still contributing fairly well. I think he obviously had a rocket put under him by the manager um, last month in terms of his attitude and his fitness, and I think he's responded well to that. As I mentioned earlier in the, in the tonight's pod, I think he's done well in terms of varying his game and improving his link-up play. I think he's contributed quite a lot in that respect. Maybe hasn't scored as many goals because of it, because he is playing a wee bit deeper than he normally would. And but So I, I don't think they'd be any happier than me than that if Morelos does stay. But that then leaves you Morelos, Eton, Roof and Defoe, which... Just, you, you, you kind of keep all these guys happy when you only tend to play one man up front with, with two attacking midfielders behind that, that sole striker. So I, I think that it's, it's really tricky. I, I think there's, the interest will be there. Um, I don't know how keen the manager will be to to let him go now. So I think six, eight weeks ago when we brought in Etten and Roof, I think he probably would have been quite happy to, to move him on, but with, with, with Roof injured. Okay, there's some suggestions he should be back for the Celtic game, and but and Itton also struggling with injury, and he's had a couple, two or three now. In fact, since arriving, the manager might be less keen to to lose Morelos. But in terms of balancing the finances, he, he might well have to go, especially if we want to bring in another player in, in one of the sort of midfield positions or the sort of right right wing area. Not that we we play just sort of inside right rather than anything else. So. It's, it's a tricky question to answer. Um, I think there'll be few Rangers fans wanting the lad to go, but I think there'll also be few unhappy if he does go for the correct money and we invest that money or some of that money in the, re in the other parts of the team which clearly need it. So it's, again, it's a tough, it's going to be a tough 24 hours for the manager and, and for Ross Wilson. Um, they also will probably be travelling to Colombia, I'd imagine, so you will probably won't have his phone on, so it'll be his agent that'll be dealing with a lot of that. So um, I, I just think we've just got to see what happens. Um, I think it might well go, right, go down to the wire. Um, I don't think they might just sign one player. I think they might sell, sign two if anyone else goes. But I do think I think we'll have to temper our, our expectations in that regard. I don't think, for example, if we do sell Morales for 20 million, I don't think he'll, we'll, we'll be spending 20 million. I think we'll be lucky if we spend... Um, a third of that, so we'll just have to wait and see. Um, I don't think anybody can answer that that question unless you're 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 somebody directly involved with Rangers. Ross, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something on on Morelos here, and I suspect this will be deeply unpopular, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I think it's come at the time that that we should move on from the whole Morelos thing. Um, in terms of if if we get a, a decent bid tomorrow, I would take it. Because I just think that the squad and the team um, need to be, we need to move on. You know, if you could guarantee me that Morelos was going to stay knuckled down and, and perform as we know he, he can, then I think he's best in the league and you absolutely would take that. But I now think you've got too many days like today where he's, he's not quite on it, he's not quite there. And I think that every time that happens, it kind of devalues him a wee bit slightly. So if somebody comes in tomorrow, Ross, with anywhere between kind of 18 and 20 million, I would be wanting to take that. Um, and I know that might make me very unpopular, but I just think that as, as a team and as a squad and as things evolve and things like that, I think that we should be looking um, now beyond this situation because it's just become it's become exhausting constantly talking about will he stay, will he go, and then you're overanalyzing points from today and things like that. And I'll reiterate it again just for anybody who thinks it's harsh. If you can guarantee me that Alfredo stays and he's on ball and on point and his attitude's perfect and he's doing what he did at the start of last season, then obviously you take him because he is that. 
twenty-five million pound player. He is that. You know, he is the best in the league and everything else, and not undoubted. But the Alfredo today isn't worth anything to, to our club, and, and I think that that is becoming more often than than the the, the previous, and that, and that's where I am with it. Um, and, and like Stuart, I absolutely love the boy. I think he's he's a tremendous talent, but I just think that there comes to a point where, you know, every good thing comes to an end, and I'm definitely there with Alfredo. You see, it's at that point that it becomes a slightly strange emotional state that you're you want the player to stay and perform, but you know that he's not performing as he could, and that his head must have been turned, and that actually you find yourself really kind of starting to wish him away for the right amount of money. So it's it's a strange position. But then if you try and take the the emotion out of it, Stevie, and look at it as a purely financial exercise, as as Frankie alluded to, we have signed his replacements prior to him leaving, and that cannot be good for the budget. That must leave some kind of financial black hole. Now, Stevie, to what extent does the Galatasaray result and the fact that we're now getting group stage cash, extra television revenue, prize money, um, to what extent does all of that extra income alleviate some of that financial pressure that would have been pushing us to sell Morelos? Well, I think it does. I think along with the the commercial kind of performance, which, to be fair, um, I think we've got about 175 new partnerships on the go, which must be good financially for the club, you know, um, and without joking, you know, James Bisgrove has obviously done a good job. The the deal that was signed today um with with um you know the Indian T V deal is, is is really positive and will bring good finances. So I don't think that there's any way that this board would be reckless in terms of um they would gamble and and, and spend Alfredo's money before it's there. Um but let's be honest, um if we get, you know, a, a deal 18 to 20 million that suits us payment wise and everything else. I think that that we should take it. Um, and I think that it would be mad not to. And I would ask any single Rangers fan out there, if you were given the opportunity to sell Alfredo, um, Alfredo of today, not Alfredo, you know, the, the, the striker that we know he can be when his attitude's on, because we've not seen that in a while. But if you were given that option to sell him and buy a 4 million attacking midfielder that would make the, the difference, that's what our team needs at the moment. Um, so we do, unfortunately, we for Alfredo we have evolved past him now. I think in terms of we don't rely on him anymore, um, and we certainly haven't relied on him this season. So I would be inclined to say that if you gave me the opportunity to sell him for that money and bring in that attacking midfielder that we do need and would make the difference, then I would be I would be saying that that's where we should be. I, I think you're right. And and obviously, as you said, we've kind of identified a couple of weak points in the squad where that money could be very usefully reinvested. Um, obviously, we need a bit more strength on the right flank. We could always, everyone talks about the combative holding midfielder that we've apparently not had for a number of years. Um, other people are also saying we could do with another striker, another goal scorer, because Cedric Itt and Kamar Roof, they have different strengths to their game, but Jermaine Defoe cannot be counted on to, to play 90 minutes every week. So there's definitely areas of the squad that could do with, um, you know, reinvestment or, or reinforcements. And so I think I think you're right, Stevie, that... I would just love, with... I would love somebody, mate, that can take a shot. You know, a lot <laughs> yeah. of people, a lot of people have got, you know, things that they want, like you just said. You stick a, a number eight in that Rangers team that can... Um, you know, that can play one twos with Aribo and, and those skillful players that we do have, but somebody that can shoot and it adds a completely different dimension into that. Because you don't you don't need to have a guy that can, you know, score a 30 yarder every week. But if you've got somebody that teams think can know they can strike the ball, that might strike it and get deflections and, and pitches in with 10 goals a season, I say that changes the dynamic of everything because then teams can't sit so deep. Because if you give him the space that our midfielders currently get, and they do get a lot of space, I mean, how many times should Jack have shot today? Um, Kamara doesn't shoot at all. So you get somebody in that can shoot the ball, mate. And and I'm sorry, I would swap Alfredo for that in terms of now that we have other striking options. I think that would make us a completely different animal. I completely agree. And actually, I'm, I'm glad you said it because I had the same thoughts today about Ryan Jack take a shot. Ryan Jack actually has form for scoring against St Johnston from outside. Uh, sorry, scoring against Ross County from outside of the box. Just willing him to take a take a punt um, and show that we have more than one dimension. But it, it just never happened today. So I, I completely agree with you there, Stevie. 
Now, Frankie, just as a, as a last word on this week's show, um, obviously the, the transfer window isn't just about bringing players in, but it's about outgoings as well and, and generating funds to, to support the, the club and, and support reinforcements on the pitch. Um, Stephen Gerrard in the past has been quite open about the fact that all of our players kind of have a price tag. Um, and if, if sensible bids come in, then we would entertain that. But we're now talking 24 and a half hours until the transfer window shuts uh, at 11 p.m. tomorrow on, on Monday. In that time, obviously, it's it's pretty impossible to identify and recruit any reinforcements if we were to lose certain players. So with the, the time left in the transfer window being so short, I know that Gerard has said we'll entertain reasonable bids, but with only 24 hours left to go, do any of our players become unsellable if we cannot find replacements? I think we've probably reached that point. Um, guys like Barisic, Tav, are, have, must be highly rated elsewhere. Um, I don't think there's any doubt in that. Um, Tav's performances, especially this season, have been fantastic. So there must be English teams interested in him. But as well as Nathan Parsons done it right back when he's came in, um, clearly we, we can't we can't go with him for as our first choice right back and as you mentioned we, we don't have a huge amount of time to sign a replacement and I think the same can be said on the left hand side I think big Calvin Bass has done okay I think he's a bit raw his decision making isn't the ideal at times and his positioning isn't the fantastic defensively but it certainly looks a decent find actually um, so but again you're not going to go with Calvin Bass as your first choice left back and, and sell Barisic it's just isn't going to happen. So as much as Ross Wilson, I'm sure he'll have um, reams of replacement players um, for for when guys do move on. Uh, there's there's a difference between saying we, we can sign player A to, to, to replace Tav, but doing that with less than, I don't know, 12 hours in a transfer window is a bit different. So um, I think every player does have their price, but at, at the same time, we're, we're trying to build something here and I think your key players are your key players. And as much as Stevie and yourself are right about Morelos, um, I, I think if you sell Morelos and another key player, then you're really sort of hamstringing yourself for the, for any sort of title challenge you want to make. Um, and So I, I don't think we'll see anybody of note leave tomorrow. It might well be one of the French guys we've mentioned earlier, your Jones or your Stuart might might move on loan. Um it just depends on, on on who we can bring in. We definitely need a midfielder. Um, whether or not that's an attacking player, an out-and-out -out attacking midfielder or a sort of right-sided player, I'm not so sure because I, I do worry. I, I think we, we do miss your sort of, it's a bit your um, cliche term, but your sort of destroyer type. Um, but the problem is, how often did that team player get a game? I mean, ask Ross McCrory, you can ask. Greg Dorkey about about uh, the, the chances they got, so or, or the minimal chances they got. So it's it's uh, as I say, it's tough. I, th I think what I think we do need to sign at least one or two players, but um, I, I don't think we'll see anyone of note, except in Morelos possibly moving on. And I think that's a good thing in terms of uh, continuity for our team and our chances of success. And and I think um, I think it's it's important to finish the, the pod tonight and to be really positive. We didn't play fantastically well today at all. We're pretty poor in fact. But to be top of the league, uh, notwithstanding Celtic's game in hand, and, and to only have conceded three goals so far this season, and to qualify again for the Europa League is, is really is fantastic going. So I really want the, the team and the manager and the fans to take heart for that and, and, and take morale from it, because we're a good team. And when you, and you see it when we're playing well, we're really, really tough to, to beat, really tough to defend against. We create chances. We play some fantastic football at times. So it is a bit disappointing when you do play bad like today, but at least we did get the win. And I think that we'll see more of that this season. So we've got to, to strap in and get ready for that. And uh, just hope that we can we can keep winning because and I hope we can start with, with that in, in a couple of weeks at uh, Parkhead because I, I, Celtic have done well this season. I don't think anybody can deny that, certainly um, in the, in the domestically. But I think they're there for the taking. It's been a long time best part of 25 years since we won two games in a row at Parkhead, but I think that this team's capable of doing it. Um, I think it's a big advantage uh, that we're going there and there isn't going to be um, 60,000 Celtic fans there. So let's let's get stuck into that. Let's be positive and, and let's really take the, 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 the good start to the season into into the, 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 the darker nights and, and really show what we're, what we're made of. 
Look, I think it's it, it's a really difficult one to call tomorrow with, with deadline day that I can actually see it going either way. I can see us, you know, keeping hold of everyone and not bringing anyone else in, but I can also see us selling two or three players and bringing in two or three players. So it's it's a very, very difficult one to try and predict. And all I'll say to that is that you can obviously keep up to date with with all of the developing transfer news as it happens over on the forums at www.jersnet.co.uk. Um, gents, we've kind of we've, we've run over the hour, so I think it's it's best that we wrap things up there. So, um, listen, I'd like to say a, a massive thank you to to both Frankie and Stevie for for giving up their time and, and joining me this evening. The show will be back next week, uh, Sunday at nine thirty, as always, looking at the uh, the fallout from transfer deadline day as well as the international break um, and previewing the the first old firm of the season and the first old firm behind closed doors as well and, and trying to see what kind of impact that will have. Um, as I say, please do head over to the website to check out for all of the, the developing transfer news and, and join the forum where you can find Stevie and Frankie as well as myself and all of the other Jersnet podcast contributors. Um, as we say every week at, at the moment, please do look after yourselves, please look after each other and stay safe. Um, and until next time, thank you very, very much for listening and have a great week. <laughs>